Hi there. Um, I'd like to start out, first of all, how many people here have an iPhone or an iOS device of some sort? Yep, that looks like about numbers I would expect. I don't have a very good throwing arm. How many people have an Android phone? All right, let's try baseball style, or softball style. Okay, how about a Windows phone, which I've seen, not as many as I thought actually, I've seen quite a lot around here compared to what I would have seen, would have normally expected. Okay, hands up who has in their household, so their family, one or more of those, so iOS and Windows Phone, or some combination thereof. That's pretty much everybody. All right, let's see what we can get down the middle. I did say I had a bad throwing arm. Okay, I think that really sort of answers my first question is, why do we need to go cross-platform? Unlike, you know, in the, in the 90s with Windows, there is no platform that has 95% of the market in mobile. Android has a lot. iOS has less, depending on which market share you look at. And Windows Phone has a little bit less, depending yet again on which market you look at. Over here, it seems to be more than most other countries, and depends on who you talk to, on who's got more. But the main point is that, you know, if you're writing mobile apps, you can't just target one platform anymore. Maybe if it's a very niche one for one company, they only want to standardize on you know, Android or Windows Phone, um, you might be able to. But if it's a normal you know, sort of consumer app, you, you're pretty much going to have to go on multiple platforms. Be that two platforms, three platforms, you know, whatever your customers require. And this is even more so if you're you know, a service company like a bank or a you know, SaaS provider like Xero, for example, or not so much Vend. Um, their one, I think, is a little bit more specific to you know, we want to till, therefore an iPad is probably the best choice. So, how many people have heard of, well, how many people use WhatsApp? Not very many, surprisingly. What the hell, last monkey. He was gonna sit up there for the rest of it, but. How many people here knew that one of the main used clients of WhatsApp is a J2ME app? Probably not very many. Um, a lot of people in Silicon Valley, it seems, when WhatsApp sold to, to Facebook for a very large amount of money, didn't actually realize that WhatsApp was so big. And it's, mo most the, it's mainly big outside of the US. So in some of the more emerging markets, like India, for example, where people don't necessarily have iPhones or Android phones, they've got you know, Nokia phones and Symbian phones and all sorts of other usually cheaper phones. Now, this might be going a bit far for normal, you know, normal apps, but the main point is one platform will not cut it anymore. You, know, you can't just target one, one platform. So I'm gonna have a quick look at three different ways of doing these. And I think one of them, Brian's covered off really well. I sort of had in my notes, so you know, if you wanna learn about this one, which we'll get to in a minute, you know, talk, go to Brian's talk, he's just been on, so. Tim Bray had a really interesting um, article at the start of this year. And he was talking about um, you know, the state of server-side and client-side stuff. And his just was pretty much, and I do agree with him, server-side's been solved. You know, whether or not you choose PHP or Ruby or, you know, .NET or whatever. Server-side, we know how to, you know, write large-scale apps, scale, you know, scale them up, make them stable. You know, MV whatever is pretty much one, that one. Client-side, however, is a completely other matter. We've got three completely independent platforms that don't really look like each other. Some fundamentals do, but mostly they don't. And they're completely incompatible. And then you've got the web as well, and desktop, and you know, whatever else. You know, even if you're just looking at the web, there's probably more JavaScript frameworks for doing web stuff than there are people in the room. There's a lot of them. So the first one is HTML5. Um, and I think Brian, as I said, Brian's covered this pretty much as, as well as I could, as well as anyone could possibly. It was a, a good talk, I enjoyed that. So the whole idea of this is, you know, write once, run it anywhere. So you're gonna be pa packaging your stuff up into a Cordova or PhoneGap, or you write your own container, as you like. Um, and then using something like Topcoat, um, jQuery Touch, Kendo UI, that sort of thing. It's relatively easy to make an app, assuming that you already know HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. 
Um, but you're likely to end up with an app that doesn't look like an iPhone app when it's running on the iPhone, or it doesn't look like an Android app or work like an Android app when it's running on that platform, and same across the other ones as well. So you may end up spending a lot of time customizing your, you know, the styling of your app to actually look like the platform that you want to run on. Um, which, or you end up with you know, an app that looks the same across all of them and no one really knows what it's meant to look like. Users tend to get a bit confused. Now, as a sort of aside, um, in the UK recently, there was an article, um, and all, the, all this stuff is going to be up on, on GitHub and stuff, so you know, it's a very long URL. I couldn't find a URL shortener that would do it particularly well. They had an article on the various mobile banking apps in the UK, and there's about eight, I think, major banks that they looked at. And they ranked them from worst to best, and it was quite obvious looking through the apps that the ones that rated worst were, we have a mobile site and we've stuck it inside a frame and really done nothing else down to, you know, we've got a, a website and we've done a lot of customization and tried to make it look like a mobile app and work like a mobile app and stuck it in a frame, and then the native apps at the bottom. Now, of course, you as a responsible developer wouldn't do that. You know, you wouldn't just take something that, you know, is basically a website, put it into a, an app frame and do it, but your managers might make you. Okay, so the second method, um, which is what I do in my day job, I work at ANZ Bank, that second method is coding it twice. I think this is actually what most people do, um, to, you know, most mobile app shops. So if you're writing iOS, you're writing Objective-C in Xcode, you target iOS. If you're doing Java, you're, uh, sorry, um, Android, you're writing in Java, you deploy it on there, C Sharp on Windows. The downside of this is, well, the upside of this is it's, you know, it's absolutely native. You know, there, there is no more closer to the, I don't know, the platform original designation as you can, you know, as you can get. The downside of this is that you either need to run an Android team and an iOS team, and how do you keep those two teams sort of feature-wise in sync, or you try and merge them, and you have either one person takes, you know, say, the login ticket, and they go and implement it on both platforms, and you've got the context switching of, of the person going, all right, I'm writing Objective-C, now I'm writing Java, oh, okay, hang on, the brackets are over, no, it's got square ones, oh, yeah. So the context, mental context switching of that can be huge. Um, as I'm finding out at the moment. It isn't quite as bad as it might sound on, on the surface, but it's, you know, it's kind of almost painful knowing that there are better ways of doing it, and this is the way that most people use. Now, the, the method that I'm going to mostly focus on um, is what I'm terming cross-platform native. So the ideal goal here, you know, absolute best case, is to have one language and library, sort of like HTML5, but still use all the native controls that you would get um, on each platform. So your Android app is using Android controls. Your iOS app is using iOS controls. Windows Phone, um, sorry, Windows Phone apps, same again. The only problem is that this is a pipe dream because those platforms are so different, especially if you mix web in as well, if you need a web front end or desktop, they're just so different under the hood. You know, conceptually you've got screens and they animate to one, and it's all kind of similar at a high level. But as soon as you get a little bit lower, there's just no way to get absolutely native across all the platforms. So you're going to have to compromise somewhere. It's just a matter of where you compromise. Um, for anyone who's been around Microsoft for a while, you've probably come across the name Charlie Kindle. Um, he has a wonderful haircut like mine. <laughs> He's now working at Amazon on, um, I think it's a payment thing they just announced. He's been sort of stealth for ages. He was looking at the, the sort of, you know, write once, run anywhere. Um, sort of fallacy, really, um, in some blog posts a couple of years ago. And he sort of came to the conclusion that the focus needs to be for apps and for websites as well, is making the user experience the best you possibly can so as you're not compromising at that level, but you then try and share as much stuff between platforms and, and get you know, happy developers as much as you can as well. But usually I think the user experience should be the one that wins out. Okay, so I actually originally had this slide titled Delphi XE5, um, and that was even before I knew that Embarcadero were a sponsor. <laughs> it's now changed to app method, and I've done a few tweaks. But most of it is still pretty much the same. So what app method is, um, and if you're interested in this at all, go and talk to um, Damien and, and co outside, is that you write code in Delphi or C++. Um, these came out of Delphi and C++ Builder. Um, you've got a common cross-platform base library, so you can actually share code between the two. Maybe it's some business logic, that sort of stuff. So you've got you know, nice sharing there. 
But the only downside of this is that it's abstracting the UI. And I say downside, and it's the same sort of downside as HTML5. It's not a downside if you don't consider it a downside, so it's not a particularly big one. So they're abstracting the UI out. So you're using an app method button, not an Android button. It looks like an Android button, but it might not actually be an Android button under the hood. So maybe if Google decided to change the design language to look at, make it look like you know, iOS 7, which I, they're unlikely to do, obviously, um, you've got to wait for the people at app method and Barcadero to port that over and make it look right. It's an interesting product, though, especially if you've got a sort of a you know, legacy Delphi code base, and there's a lot of Delphi out there. I know I've certainly written a fair bit of it in my, in my past. Now, the second one that I, I was looking at, and I must admit I'm a little bit perplexed on who the target audience for this is. So Oxygen, or Oxygen, I think it's emphasis on the E, um, is another Pascal compiler. So they've taken, I think it was Open Pascal or one of the... Um, one of the Pascal products that's existed for a while. They've also just done a C-sharp product as well. The idea is exactly the same, just different language. They've made that compile down, probably through LLVM, um, compile down to whatever the native platform is, so iOS or Android. Um, the downside of them, or the upside of this, is that you're using all the native stuff, so exactly the same as you would do in Objective-C or Java, so all the, exactly the same controls. But the downside is that there's no common library. So you go off and write your you know, Pascal app for iOS, and you go over to do it on Android, and you've basically got to write it again. The language is the same, but all the libraries, down to you know, dictionaries and all the stuff that shouldn't be platform specific is. And I believe they're, trying, they're starting to implement a cross-platform you know, sort of library underneath with all the nice bits. But um, yeah, it's not there yet. The, the bit I don't really get with this is if you're a native, you know, native developer, so I, um, Objective-C or Java, why would you use this over, you know, why would you use Oxygen over this it doesn't really make sense to me. You know, you're not getting a lot of benefit. And if you're a C-sharp developer, you can't use all the stuff you've developed previously or bring in PCLs or stuff from NuGet because it doesn't support all the base framework. So I don't get who the target market is. It is an option, though. Um, finally, and the one that I'm going to you know, dig into most um, is the Xamarin tools. And Xamarin um, sort of allows you to use C-sharp F sharp or VB.net. The VB.net stuff's a little bit underbaked at the moment, it's only just come out. Um, you still get access to the native platform. So you can call you know, all the Objective C functions, all the Android stuff, all the base class stuff that goes with either side, but you also get the .NET framework sort of tagged in the bottom. And a lot of that is not technically the .NET framework, it's the mono framework, but you know, it was designed to be a, a direct port. Although there's more and more stuff that Microsoft is opening up. Um, like HTTP client and all that sort of thing. So you can actually use the same stuff as you would use on Windows, and actual same binaries. It's quite good, all they had to do was get legal to agree. So you're sharing common, common code, common platform independent stuff, you're just rewriting your UI. So keeping the user facing stuff you know, as specific to the platform and as native as possible while sharing all the sort of guts that your user doesn't really care about because they don't see it, but you know, obviously it's the common stuff that, that works across platforms. Now, as I said before, it's, it's uh, based on Mono, which has been around for a long time. Um, and a lot of the guys working at Xamarin are the same people that have been de developing Mono for the past 14 odd years, 12 years, somewhere around there. So it's actually quite funny looking at a few people's like, LinkedIn profiles and you just sort of you know, bring Miguel's up the side, da, 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 and then some of the other kernel hackers and they've all pretty much worked at the same place. Um, so what, you, what you're actually writing here, or what you're writing in, um, is Xamarin Studio or Visual Studio. They've just done a port over, no, not a port, a version that runs in that, but you're still using some of the native tools. So you're still using Xcode if you want to you know, build UIs and stuff in there. So it's a little bit of a split, and you still need a Mac to, to do iOS stuff. Now, one big difference between these two platforms, between the iOS and the Android one, um, as it says up there, the iOS one doesn't have a JIT, and it's not a runtime per se. It's an ahead-of-time compile, so it's sort of like the JIT, but it's done at compile time. Whereas the Android one is a full mono virtual machine. You've got you know, all the functionality, pretty much, that mono has. So you can do a lot more. You can JIT. You can you know, reflection.emit and all the nice bits and pieces that go with that. The main reason why the iOS one isn't is actually because Apple doesn't allow it. The iPhone, you can't say, I want to execute in that data block, um, whereas Android, you can. OK, so one way to think of this is if you look at the normal iOS stack and just pluck out Objective-C, just the language, not all the frameworks, not all of Cocoa Touch, and just replace that with C-sharp. So that's also the same as what the Oxygen one does. 
take the Android stack, pull out Java, just the language, not the you know, java.star, and just chuck in C Sharp there. But also chuck in the rest of the .NET framework as well. So you've got all of that you know, massive library of common stuff. And you generally end up with applications that look roughly like this in architecture terms. So at the top, you've got your sort of platform specific stuff, and all of this is C sharp sort of top to bottom. You can pull in you know, Java or Objective C stuff if you want, but you know, if, if you don't want to, it's, it's C sharp from top to bottom. So you've got your user interface and all your application layer bits and stuff that's talking to, I don't know, you know, um, you know accelerometers and the um, GPS and all that sort of stuff at the top. But all your business layer stuff, like talking to the database and going out to net, making network calls and all that sort of thing, that's all common between the applications. So an obvious next question is, how much can we actually reuse, given that, in this case, reuse is one of the main motivations? You know, how much code can I have on both platforms? And the answer, of course, as in any software, is it depends. You know, how long is a piece of string? Um, one application that, well, one guy that publishes pretty much all his stats um, is a guy called Frank Kruger. Um, and one of his applications, and we'll look at this other one in a minute, is called iCircuit, which is um, a real-time circuit simulator. So for all you, um, you know, sort of electronics type people, and I imagine there's going to be a few more of those given that there's those fun Duino things in there, so everybody gets to tweak around with it a bit more, which will be fun. Actually, I think I can see someone's lights flashing over there from that. So you put diodes and resistors and whatever else on, you wire it up to oscilloscopes and it does it you know, with sort of millisecond precision. It's, it's quite an impressive app. But he's getting sort of 70 to 90% um, reuse across platforms. iOS being the, the lower end of that, mostly because that was where he was making most of his money. That was the app store that, you know, he, he released this probably four years ago while the, when the app store was still a particularly viable business. It's not really anymore. But he put a lot more effort into that platform, so there's a lot more platform-specific code on that one. Whereas the other ones, you know, the, the green blocks are actually the same amount of code, the like, same number of lines of code. It's just a matter of you shrink it based on you know, the total line of lines of code for that platform. Now, his other app is um, one called Calca. Well, one of his other apps. He's got quite a number of them. And Calca is sort of a symbolic text editor. So you can think of Notepad with markdown capabilities mashed up with Wolfram Alpha. It's yeah, it's an interesting app, um, very useful if, if this is something that you, that you need. So you can you know, sort of write, as you can hopefully see up there, you know, write some description of Shannon's entropy equation, which is something that goes way over my head, but I can read roughly what it's doing. And then you can put an equation in there and you know, do the right little symbol and it'll solve it for you. So as you can probably guess, a lot of this is back-end processing. So there's full parsing of all this text, there's the bit that actually goes off and solves the equations for you, and you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that is not platform dependent in this. So you can see the, the sort of numbers that he's getting, you know, 90, 75 to 95%. And the main differences between the three platforms is that Windows and OS X both have sort of a, you know, a document model. You can pretty, go, pretty much go file, new, thing that looks like Notepad. Um, OS X has even more stuff, sort of boilerplate, that comes out of it. So he has to actually do even less work. Whereas iOS has pretty much none of that. You know, you've got a text view, but that's about it. You've still got to do all the, you know, saving dialogues and, you know, pushing it to iCloud or whatever else he's doing. Um, another project that's kind of interesting to look at if you, you know, if you want to have a look at different places that, or different ways of doing these, is a project called Property Cross. And you can think of Property Cross as sort of like Trade Me Property, like a you know, Trade Me Property app. So you can search for, I want a two bedroom house in so and so area. Um, probably a good idea to have at least a, some idea of London places because this is based on UK data. And you can get a list back and you know, drill into a house and look through the photos and all that sort of thing. But it's been implemented in a whole bunch of different cross-platform tools. So there's you know, a Kendo UI one, an Accenture one, and I don't recall seeing a Topcoat one, but there probably is. And all the Xamarin stuff, native ones, um, I think Delphi is up there recently, although I haven't seen the, um, the other one up there, probably because it was only released in the last few days. But anyway, there's lots of them, but they're also generally implemented by people who know the platform. So it'll be a developer evangelist from Embarcadero, or it'll be you know, someone who's worked with one of these other platforms a lot. So you're not getting someone who's, you know, it's my first project and they're trying to implement this and all the cruft that would go with that. These are generally done by people who know their own platform and are just re-implementing um, the idea in the app. So that's all up on, well, it's on propertycross.com, but it all links off to GitHub. 
So some of the strategies that we've got for building apps. And on this one, I really wanted to slide with all the people from the usual suspects, but I couldn't quite fit it in. So you've got all the usual ways of building applications, especially building .NET applications. So we've got inversion of control is very important if you're doing a, a cross-platform app. Um, dependency injection is another one, because you can, if you control your dependency injection from the top level, you can inject, for example, an Android version of some interface versus an iOS version. And then your bottom, the code at the bottom doesn't really care, it just has an interface to talk to. Um, messaging is another important one because um, on mobile platforms, asynchronous stuff um, is very important because you need to get off the UI thread as much as possible or else your application just kind of stutters along, which is never good. Um, strangely enough, actually, the Google Hangouts app on iOS is really bad for that. You know, you go and type something and if someone else sends a message in, the whole thing just locks up and judders, which is surprising because Google's apps are usually really good. Um, separation concerns and doing your apps in layers, which is pretty standard these days, I think, um, is important, as is test-driven development, because you know, it may be slightly re a religious argument, but test-driven development, I think, is important in pretty much whatever you're doing, at least having tests, a test suite. Um, and the Xamarin stuff ships with both NUnit Lite, which runs on the device, so you kind of boot it up with your stuff in it, and you can run your tests or have it automated. Um, or you can just use full NUnit or XUnit or you know, whatever one you want to on the desktop which tends to be what I do. Um, I target, if I'm gonna target two platforms, I'll target three. So iOS, Android, and full framework tests. So I treat my tests as another platform. Databases are another one. There really is only one sort of major option for databases aside from I'm gonna throw my, file, my, you know, my data on, on a file, which is valid, you know, if you don't have a lot of data or you know, it, it's not particularly performance intensive. And SQLite has pretty much won this war on every platform. Um, I'm not particularly familiar with the options on Windows Phone. Um, I think it might be some variant of SQL Server, but there is also a C-sharp version of SQLite that has pretty much all the same interfaces. It's just someone's ported it to C-sharp. Now, SQLite is a reasonably full relational database. Um, it's all you know, ACID compliant and all the rest of it. It's very, very well tested um, and used in a hell of a lot of things. And it's on every iPhone, every Android phone, probably unless someone strips it out. Um, it can be available on most other platforms as well. You either include it in there or it's already on the platform. So there's two main ways of getting there. You've got the mono.data.sqlite ADO.net client if you happen to like ADO. Um, or my preferred way is to use SQLite Net, um, which is a wrapper, um, again, by Frank Kruger, who was um, doing Calca and, and stuff before. And that's a really basic object relational mapping tool. So it's not like in Hibernate or something like that where you, you, know, you sort of start it customer and you end up with this massive object graph that may or may not be lazy loaded. It's just, I've got a row in a database and I want that in an object, or I've got an object and I want that as a row in the database, vice versa, or lists of them, or you know, whatever. But what it lacks in you know, sort of object graph management, it makes up for in speed. So you can load you know, thousands of rows into an object in you know, a couple of milliseconds. It's very, very fast and very useful. Um, for anyone who's used um, Source Gear Vault, in the past, back when um, Visual Source Safe was still a thing. I think pretty much everyone's probably migrated off the Git, but for those who can remember back far enough, um, Zoomero is a product from the same people that did that. And what Zoomero does is it mostly just manages your SQLite database, so it's actually independent of what you use. You could use anything that talks to SQLite at the other side. And it'll sync up with SQL Server, so you can move data backwards and forwards and do all the conflict resolution, that sort of thing. It's quite handy, though. Um, Akavach, which I probably just mispronounced, um, is another one from Paul Betts at GitHub, and I think they use it internally quite a, in quite a few places at, at um, like the GitHub for Windows client and stuff like that. That's more of a key value store. So, you know, I've downloaded an image from a, a URL, I'm gonna stick that as a key value pair, you know, in there. And that can either persist, I think it's in memory, on disk, or you can backend it onto SQLite again, which is quite handy if you, you want it, you know, persistent for a lot longer. And you can throw anything in there, it's just a, you know, it's a binary blob. The last one down the bottom um, is Couchbase for .NET, which um, Xamarin have actually just put into the .NET Foundation, I think they're calling it. It's some new organization that Microsoft and a bunch of other people are doing, and everyone's sort of contributing stuff, and I have no idea if they just go there to die or not, because it only got announced yesterday. So Couchbase is a large NoSQL database, so it runs you know, large sort of clusters of it, and um, yeah, the last time I really came across it in production was at the BBC, so you can get the idea of the sort of, you know, size that this thing can go to. But Couchbase 
Lite and Couchbase for .NET is one that runs on, on phones, on devices. Um, but you're still querying it natively, so if you're using the Objective-C version, you're doing MapReduce because you know, it's a NoSQL database, so chances are you're doing MapReduce. You're doing MapReduce in some sort of Objective-C syntax. If you're doing it on Android, it's some sort of Java syntax. The one that's ported to .NET, it's probably Link because that does MapReduce really well. Its other main sort of claim to fame is if you've got a back-end Couchbase database, you can, it does syncing between there. So maybe someone else has, adjust, has um, modified one little part of your object graph of the document that you're looking at, and you've done another one, it'll automatically handle the merging and that sort of thing. It's quite a nice little product, I think. Um, I think I'd probably use, use it locally rather than having the remote server, but that's an option that's there. Um, a phone without a network connection, or a, I think a portable device without a network connection is pretty much useless. So you've got to be able to get data on and off, otherwise it's just a very heavy battery with a screen. Not bad for watching movies, I suppose. So from a networking point of view, you've still got HTTP client available, which seems to be a, a particularly good way of doing it, a, you know, a, a well-implemented um, library. And Paul Betts, again, um, him who did Akavach, Akavache, I can never get that right, has done another one called Modern HTTP Client. So what he's doing is HTTP Client provides a plugin interface. So you can say, I want to use all this nice, you know, common .NET bit at the top, but I want to plug something else in to do the actual network connections. So he's plugged in NSURL session um, if you're on iOS, or OKHTTP OK if you're on Android. And so you get all the nice native bits and pieces, so it's interacting and being able to pull in things like the cache settings on your phone, which they, you know, if you're not, if you're just talking normal sockets, you've got to work out the, um, sorry, not cache proxy. Um, you've got to be able to pull the proxy stuff out of the system, whereas the stuff that's built into, um, say, Cocoa Touch just does that automatically. It's just part of the framework. So you end up also getting a lot better performance as well. Now, if you're using stuff like REST Sharp or um, Service Stack, that sort of thing, that works as well, generally. Um, there's a few cases where I've come across where you know, they, they didn't compile, let alone work. Um, but usually, if you make a, you know, an iOS-specific um, library for that, out of that, just out of the normal source code, it'll, it'll work. It just doesn't work as a PCL sometimes. You can, of course, just use all the native stuff. So all the third-party bits and pieces like AF Networking, OK, HTTP is actually third-party as well. It's not from Google. Um, or just use NSURL session, which is the, the standard iOS one. So all of that is available. Now, at sort of a, an overarching wrapping everything up way, um, the MV whatever stuff has pretty much won for doing uh, mobile apps, I think. So MVVM was always really popular um, from Caliburn, from doing Windows Phone, I think. Um, MVP. I think came and evolved eventually into MVVM, and MVC is just littered all over the iOS stuff. They, that's a pattern that they just love over there, along with Delegate. It's just everywhere. And then there's the other one, which came from Amy last year. Um, MVVM Cross and Reactive UI, I think, are two of the main ones that have really sort of shone in, in this one. They've actually got enough momentum to be, you know, sort of project, maintain projects unto themselves. Um, MVVM Cross is kind of opinionated, so it's, you know, the, I will name it this way and put it in this folder so it's auto discovered, which is nice. And there's also lots of plugins, so if you need to get to, you know, the, the Compass or the GPS or something like that, there's already a plugin to do it on multiple platforms. Um, and MVVM Cross, at last count, does iOS, Android, Windows Phone, I don't think it does 7.1, it certainly does 8. Windows 8. I think someone even did a Windows Forms version. It's, you know, it, it's done across m many, many platforms. Um, Reactive UI, I don't fully get yet. I keep looking at the source code and going, it's like, sort of like functional programming. I look at it and go, this looks really cool, and then I just, my brain explodes, and it's not pretty. Reactive UI looks cool, though, so I'm going by the marketing text, you know, the GitHub readme file, <laughs> not so much as actually using it, but it does look very interesting. Both of them, however, have a very strong binding um, story. So the idea of getting stuff out of your view model or out of your data somehow onto the screen and back again um, is very strong in both of them. Most people tend to roll their own, which is also why there's lots of other ones that have one project with them or someone does it as part of another project, puts it up on GitHub, and then it kind of dies. Um, personally, I think rolling your own is not a bad idea, but I think the, the real trick is knowing when your 
own, your, the framework that you've rolled yourself gets so big that you should probably be using one of the other ones. So the art is working out when to jump across and go, right, I just need to dump that and just move into this one that's already you know, been, you know, well, I don't like using the word scale. It's already been used in large applications and they've got rid of the, the problems that go with that. Now, one of the main MVVM cross apps that you will probably have seen but wouldn't have known that it was, was the Nokia Mix Radio app. Um, which came out recently, which was the one that they did on the Android phone that looks like Windows phone. Um, and that was all done with MVVM Cross, so it works, I think, I don't know if they've released it on Windows phone, but it certainly is multi-platform across there. It was actually quite a surprise. I got a, a tweet from someone that I, I knew in the UK that went, hey, thanks for that help that you gave me 12 months ago. We've just built this. And I looked at the link and went, holy cow, that's quite cool. So just a bit of a shout out to um, both Stuart and Paul. The amount of effort that these guys put in and getting you know source out there and just helping the community is they're both amazing they're really good now i was going to do a code demo and i might actually still do it i don't know i'll see i'm, I'm a little bit short i'm running a bit shorter than i would have done before the code however is up on github so if you want to have a look through it and a dig through it, um, you can download a, a trial version of the Xamarin tools if you want to try that. There's a, a free one, you get like a 30 day trial and then it just cuts down the amount of IL that you can use after that. So what this thing is, is a little currency app because I've still got money in the UK that I'm bringing over and every time I look at the New Zealand exchange rate, I just want to cry. But what it does is it uses um, open exchange rate, which is an open exchange rate service, <laughs> hence the name. Um, it, it just hits a URL, gets a JSON document back, you parse it, it has everything based in US dollars. So, you know, one US dollar is this much New Zealand, is this much Kenyan, is this much, there's a whole 160 odd of them, something like that. It also looks at the Dogcoin API, because, you know, why would we just have US dollars when we've got dog coins? It then collects all that, puts it in the database, and then, you know, tells the front end what, you know, I might have an update for you, that sort of thing. And this works across iOS and, um, and Android. So the general architecture, and hopefully that's actually visible at the back, I've just realized it's not quite as big as I thought it might have been. So the general architecture kind of follows some of those other diagrams that I've, I showed before. So in the top box, you've got the iOS and the Android specific stuff. Um, so on the iOS side, it's using a storyboard, it's using UI collection view cells, so just the normal stuff that you would do on iOS. And on um, Android, it's using, you know, um, what are they called? Activities and the usual dialogues and all the stuff that goes with Android. Also on the platform specific stuff, I've put the ISC container, mostly because I didn't quite have time to work out the exact bits that didn't work to put it in a PCL. But I imagine with enough time I could actually move that entire ISC thing down into the common bit. And it also uses the platform specific version of SQL LightNet at that level. So it's effectively putting the PCL version in the common bit and injecting platform specific bits underneath that that then calls. So you end up with a platform specific but common piece. And all the requests sort of come down from whatever the top level, you know, the user hits refresh or they want to base it on a different currency. It calls into one using um, normal C sharp, async and await, calls into the, the next layer down which does its thing and then sends a message back up using Tiny Messenger. So it's a relatively simple application, um, but I think it illustrates one way of doing, you know, sort of cross-platform apps and keeping as much of the sort of shared stuff shared as possible um, while, you know, giving a platform-specific look, well, not look, platform-specific bit at the top. And as you can see there from the, you know, the actual UI on it, they're, they're similar, but quite different, you know, especially in the way that, say, for example, you enter how much you want to see that in that currency. One's a dialogue, one's just a completely separate screen, given the different way that those two platforms work. So, in summary, I hope this sort of gives you a good overview um, of how you can write to, you know, native cross-platform apps and gives you some options that you can use to do this, while still keeping, you know, sort of true to the platform-specific strengths that you've got, and also, you know, sharing the as much stuff as you can to try and get you know, as much reuse as possible. Because otherwise, you know, writing something twice, especially if you're doing it you know, within the space of a day, is not fun. <laughs> so thanks very much. Um, code will be up on there. Actually, the code is already up in there, but the slides will be up in there. If you want to get hold of me, there's the details. And if anyone's got any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, 
Um, or the question was, if you're building your first mobile app, would it be unwise to go with Xamarin rather than native? Um, I would say it, <laughs> it depends. If you have in-house experience of Java or Objective-C, I, I would contemplate going that way on a single platform, if you're only targeting one platform. If you're targeting multiple platforms, I'd just go straight in and use the Xamarin stuff. If you've got in-house experience of C-sharp and no mobile experience, I'd probably jump in straight into the Xamarin stuff because that's one less thing that your developers are going to have to learn. They already know the language and all the framework. They've just got to learn the mobile stuff on top rather than learning Objective-C and Java and the frameworks and the mobile-specific stuff. So, yeah, I think the harder question, and maybe it'll come up, is if you've already got both, <laughs> what do you do at that point? <laughs> There's, um, there are some tools around to take Java code and port it directly to um, C-sharp, so I think it's called Sharpen, um, which is what was used on Couchbase Lite, Couchbase.net, Couchbase Lite Net. Um, but yeah, there's, there isn't really one other than that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the question is, what's the documentation like on, on the Xamarin side, rather than, you know, if, you, if it's all in Objective-C, why not write it in Objective-C, you know, if all the examples are in that. Generally, the Xamarin documentation is considered to be very good. Um, I kind of learnt most of it when the documentation wasn't there. It was sort of before they even had a documentation team. So I didn't really get to use it firsthand, but Anecdotal evidence says, you know, a lot of people sort of go, wow, this, you know, it's, it's better than the Apple documentation or that sort of stuff. I think you still need to be able to at least read Objective-C and Java. And being able to read it and being able to write, a, you know, a large application in it is a very different thing. So I think with maybe a weekend's learning, especially if you're already, you know, in, already investing the time into learning the Xamarin stuff, so you're already aware of what the, you know, UI this is and the bits in Java are, reading Java or Objective-C of the same thing is not a particularly big deal. Um, the only downside is that if you find a nice block of code and you just want to reuse it, as a lot of people do, but may not admit off Stack Overflow, you can't just copy and paste it. You've got to rewrite it. Um, but in a lot of cases, I'm actually surprised there isn't an Objective-C to, to C-sharp conversion because there's not a hell of a difference. You know, it's going to run into some problems that don't exist on, both, on one or the other platform, but I think it wouldn't do too hard to convert, which is what they've done with Sharpen. It sort of compiles Java down, I think, and then spits out C sharp out the other side. Um, I would say yes. I'm not a game developer, so I'm not that familiar with it. If you're just writing on iOS, you've got access to all the Sprite Kit and Cocos 2D and all that sort of stuff. Um, you can definitely do it. If you want to go really cross platform, um, you can use something like Monogame, which is some of the people actually work for Xamarin who do Monogame. It's not a official Xamarin product, but that then lets you write to the XNA frameworks. So you can target, I think, Xbox, iOS, Android, Ui, 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 whatever. It's called that little Android tablet. I think it's running on PlayStation 4 now, even. Um, it's across a lot of different platforms. Um, I think it's actually the only way to get XNA on Windows Metro apps, or whatever they're called now, App Store apps. Um, Performance-wise, absolutely. Yep, definitely. Um, I think it's generally at any point in time, like 80% of the top 100 games are written in Unity, and Unity runs on mono. So while they forked a lot earlier, the whole principle of, of Unity is exactly the same. It's the mono runtime that does ahead of time compiling, and then they've built all their, you know, all the massive game stack on top of it. But the principle is the same. You know, you pretty much the same idea, but with a different focus. So yes, definitely possible to do. Um, there was a game recently called Bastion. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, that was all done um, in XNA and C Sharp, and then they just, I think they ported it in like a weekend or something to about four other platforms. You know, there's a bit of stability stuff after that, but it was very, very easy to port. Yep. Any other questions? Yep. 
If you're doing Android, you can do it all on Windows. So all on Windows and Visual Studio. So there's, you know, the, the Android SDK works across every platform. There's no limitation on where you can run it. If you want to do iOS, you have to, I think, use the, I, the Xcode build chain to do some of the signing and a few other bits and pieces. And there possibly are ways around that, but Xamarin have gone down the route of you need the Apple SDK. I think it was possibly because at that time that Apple got really unhappy with Adobe, and they said, you know, thou shalt not use other tools. And so Xamarin went, right, well, we're just going to rely on Xcode, and then they, you know, it makes it really hard for them to eliminate them. But if you want to use Visual Studio, which you can, and a lot of people you know, love Visual Studio. I used to be one of them. I don't like it quite as much now, but that's more from not using it than anything. You can run generally, um, and the actual machine split doesn't really matter, but most people will have a Mac. Um, underneath, they've got all the Xcode stuff, and a part of um, Xamarin iOS running on there is basically a build server. And in a virtual machine, they've got Visual Studio running. They're writing code in there. When they go build, it then calls over the network, does the build for them, and, and returns it back. So you can have the simulator you know, floating over as you can normally in a virtual machine. I saw a shot of Miguel's talk at Build, which finished about half an hour ago, showing Visual Studio with the full storyboard designer in it, which they didn't have up until about two hours ago. <laughs> so normally what you do is you'll be in Xamarin Studio, you know, type, 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 I want to edit a storyboard. And what a storyboard is, is a bunch of, basically, of views. So it might be, you know, a, a, well, anything, you know, a, a um, navigation controller. But then you can also do the linking between them. So when you hit this button, it automatically pushes that thing on. So if you've used an uh, um, iOS phone, you know, normal sort of animations. And you can do a lot of it without actually writing any code. You know, this, is, this button triggers this seg, which goes to this thing and this parameters. So you used to have to do that in Xcode. And then they wrote their own one that sat inside Xamarin Studio so you could edit storyboards in there. They've now ported that to Visual Studio as well. So you can do the whole thing in Visual Studio now from end to end. But you still need a Mac to do the building. Um, as I said, most people will do that. So they'll be working on a Mac in a virtual machine, and the Mac is doing the build underneath. You could have a Mac Mini or a Mac Pro sitting somewhere if you've got a way too much money, and just have you know remoting out to that machine over the network. Any other questions? OK, thank you very much. Um, oh, if anyone wants a C-sharp t-shirt, there's a bunch in different sizes up here, um, as worn by lots of people at Build, apparently. Um, there is also one women's Xamarin t-shirt on the end. Um, I'm guessing that they thought that the numbers were kind of you know, what a normal conference is, which is very few women. And I'm very happy to see a lot more women here than normal, well, than, you know, most other conferences, which is great. But there is one on the end, if there's anyone who wants them. So thank you.